I'm completely blown away by the turnout. Thank you very much. It's a huge privilege to be here. I have been attending conferences like this for years and meetups and reading. And this is the point where I dare to stand up and tell everybody about, I think, some, some pretty good achievements, some pretty big cultural changes. So really, really excited about this. My first ever submission on SlideShare. That appears at the end as well, so you don't have to <coughs> memorise it now. Structures of the talk that will appear as I go through signposting where we are. Of course, I have to start with, with context. I was going to say that our context is very different from everybody's context here, but actually listening to Elizabeth's keynote this morning, probably our context is where she was talking about in about 2000, 2001. So slightly painful to be standing here telling you this is what we were doing a year ago, this is what we were doing three, four months ago. Um, but the really important thing for me is it's how we changed and the fact that we were able to change. This is Dr. Olga Kennard, who in 1965 launched the organisation that I work for, and it's a technology and database organisation, so it's more than 53 years old now. This was her on the 50th anniversary. There was a big international conference in Cambridge, a big celebration. She's talking about the journey that led to the creation of the Cambridge Structural Database, the CSD. That's the, the scientific database. I'll tell you a little bit more in a slide or two um, <clears throat> what, what the contents of that database is. So that was a very, very proud moment for us. So it's a database of crystal structures, and I've got a couple to pass around if anyone wants to see what they look like. This one, the coloured one, is the one on the right there. For this talk, I think the interesting thing to say is it's at, it stores the positions of atoms, 3D shapes of molecules. So scientists do experiments. We're a non-profit organisation that exists to gather that information, make it available around the world. Um, it's just, it's as well as the information about the shapes of the individual molecules, the really, really crucial bit is how the molecules assemble together. There's really valuable information there that's used for, for teaching, of chemistry, for research, and um, industrial applications such as the design of new medicines and improving the manufacture of medicines as well. Um, the releases that I'm going to be talking about, um, we have unified over the last few years for the, the convenience of our users, um, eight different desktop applications, uh, multiple databases. There's the main CSD, the Cambridge Structural Database, but we have some knowledge bases derived from that as well. Um, the screenshot here is an application called Mercury, which is kind of my baby. I was one of the two original authors of that, um, starting in 1999. Um, there's a free version of that that's available. Um, so it's used by many, many tens of thousands of people around the world. That all adds up to a Windows installer size of 8 gigabytes. So it's an 8 gigabyte download for the installer. And when you install it, that's 18 gigabytes. Uh, now, when you're a scientist going to conferences and you've got a laptop with a solid state drive, having the space to have both the installer and the installed software temporarily on disk at the same time is huge. So. Um, <clears throat> those are the, um, that's what we're dealing with basically, that's the kind of thing. It's so far away from sort of web applications and things like that that I imagine is the world of many people here. We also have an annual licensing system as well. I'm not sure between chicken and egg, between um, which came first, the annual licensing and then the annual releases or the other way around, but after decades they're very, very closely intertwined. This was me in my first week, 1987. So not only is the database more than 50 years old, but I've been there for more than 30 years. I had a big celebration last September for my 30th anniversary. Um, I was hired fresh from an Oxford chemistry degree. So I do have some domain knowledge, but really I'm a computer programmer at heart. Uh, from being lucky enough to be in the first generation um, in UK schools to have computers in school and to be learning basic uh, at home and at work, at home and at school. My dad got a, amazingly got a home computer so we could learn basic together. Quite incredible. And it's been a, it has been a really, really good journey. Um, so fine, now I've told you about desktops. Duck out of water, right? what am I doing here? Why, after so many years of listening to other people talking, why do I think we've got something to talk about? One or two of you may have heard me in past conferences ask 
of speakers. How did you get past the finish line? It makes sense now that you're there, but how did you get agreement? Was it, was it a sort of, I hate to use the phrase bottom up, was it teams advocating for change or was it managers saying you need to change? So we were doing all the things that people were advocating for, but we weren't getting agreement. So that's what I want to do. I want to share what we've learned on the journey and, um, um, and how far we've got as well, because I think that's quite significant. So the title of the talk, very provocatively chosen, ever-growing monolithic releases, but it's a very fair statement. These are um, the technologies that feed into this desktop release, this 18 gigabytes that I'm talking about. Um, the oldest code is, of course, the Fortran 77. Um, I suppose of interest is Windows, Linux, and Mac. This is quite interesting. I'm going to have... Okay, can we pause for a minute and does anyone know how to turn off auto-advancing of slides in PowerPoint? <laughs> okay, <laughs> right, this will drive the speed of my talk. So C++ and Qt are the main technologies day-to-day -day that our developers are using. Um, we have scientific libraries of C++ that we have written ourselves. They're shared across multiple teams. And then Qt, or Qt, which is the correct way to pronounce it, is the framework, the graphical user inter framework, interface framework and portability framework um, that we are making really heavy use of. So it's layers, basically, layers of scientific libraries at the bottom and then applications built on top of that. And um, many of the algorithm, much of the algorithmic code is shared between multiple applications. So we have millions of lines of C++, small number of millions, I guess. I was probably a bit optimistic when I um, put in the proposal, but it's a significant amount of code. Three scrum teams um, working in parallel and very often changing core code, advertising those changes. The database format that we released, the core format, was actually launched in my first month in September 87. And it's really limiting what we can do. So my team is working on uh, gradually strangling off the old search engine. We're using the strangler pattern for a desktop application, which is quite exciting, and it's been fantastic. Um, I'm going to see if I can um, beat the slides. So we have decades of culture built around the annual release cycle, and we call it the November release. That calendar month is quite important. I am going to be talking about legacy practices, legacy code, legacy processes. And Woody Zool is one of my heroes. Uh, he has some fantastic videos with Llewellyn Falco on refactoring code that you can't even begin to understand but refactoring safely. Um, but I really like this. When working with legacy code, honour the coder and their code. We can't know their constraints. And regularly at work, it dawns on me that I am one of those legacy coders after 30 years. And it's incredible just, well, first of all, how much more productive we became in C++ than Fortran 77, but just how much we learn year on year about development practices. So I really, I very much want to try and model that in my talk. Um, but having said that, in some ways, we were ahead of our time. 1988, we were managing three releases a year. And our version control history starts in 1992. It goes back a year or two before that, but there were no useful comments. It was just a snapshot. This is the point at which we actually have descriptions of change. And we had kind of continuous integration builds in the mid-1990s. I made it so that when you pushed to our RCS version control system, whatever platform you built, you pushed it on, um, code in the area was compiled. So you got feedback within a minute or two. Um, we didn't know to call it continuous integration at that point, obviously. Um, <clears throat> but, dot, 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 the, the caveat to that is we didn't keep up with improving our scripts over years. And so it was hard for new people who joined to understand the layers of the build system. So this is what our release cycle looks like. Um, we develop for a period of time on trunk, typically 10 to 12 C++ developers these days. And it's exactly what Elizabeth talked about in the keynote. I, I, mean, I could cut through a whole load of slides by saying our testing cycle is too slow to release regularly. So 
we developed for a period of time on trunk. We're pretty good about writing unit tests for the algorithmic code. Not too bad at writing al uh, unit tests for the, the widget, the custom widgets that we have, though that's quite a lot harder. And then at some point we get to a release cycle. We create a release branch and we finish off features. Uh, we sometimes we often get asked to add new features. We test, we find problems, we fix them. We write user documentation and find more problems. Um, we fix all the bugs that we found that we'd broken in the last year. Um, so that's been our normal for a long time. Before we had version control systems that could cope with branching, we had effectively you develop on trunk and then you stop committing. You don't stop developing, but you stop committing, which has really affected the granularity of the, the commits in our version control system. So I mentioned that in 1988, we were managing to do three releases a year, so averaging four months per develop and release cycle. But by 1989, um, we were, that was the point we switched to two releases a year. And speaking recently to someone who was involved in that, um, that was okay, but by the time we got to 2003, that was the point where the releases were taking up so much of the gap that if we kept on doing two a year, there wouldn't be any time or enough time for new features. So by 2003, we switched to 12 months of elapsed time between each release. And if you look at the shape of that, maybe we should celebrate the fact that by 2016, we were still able to release every year. Because <laughs> in that time, the teams had grown. We at least doubled the number of developers. We were getting more efficient. We were writing uh, more functionality, more functionality to test. So some of the next few slides are talking about um, kind of just trying to reassure you that we do understand what the necessary practices are, but how come we were still stuck at, at once a year? <clears throat> so, um, yes, we write unit tests, and that has been successful for us at um, finding breakages early on, um, and making sure that we're actually doing what we think we're, um, that the code is doing what we intend it to do. Um, our releases over the years have become uh, so one of my colleagues talks about sealing wax and string, but you know, dozens and dozens of wiki pages that you had to copy, dozens, dozens, dozens and dozens of command lines from. So starting in 2009, I basically said, we can't carry on like this. We've got to automate as much as possible. And obviously, we've got huge safety benefits out of that. As of, I think, about three years ago, we had Team City continuous integration builds for our C++ code. Um, on, on all the platforms that we support. That's been huge. Um, some cultural things that we tried that really weren't successful. Essentially, what these say is we try to do better. We try to make it that we do test features to release standard during the year. And we try to document features to, you know, the user documentation, the user manuals that we supply during the year. And it varied within teams, it varied on the context at the time, but um, there was nothing to support people in doing that. There was no, it was so tempting to carry on and, and sometimes pressuring to carry on adding the next new feature. Um, so <clears throat> what we did as a result, um, the only way we could get agreement for release and confidence release was have an all staff testing day where once a year, as close to the end of the release as possible, we would get scientists, developers, support people, admin people together, 40 or 50 people, and run it as a competition and a team building thing. And, and it, it was fun, um, detailed, work through this. Um, your team gets a point if you find a bug, if you log it and we can use the, the bug report. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm sure you'll see where this is going to go. If we did that too early, we broke things after we did it. If we did it too late, we found problems and then there was huge pressure for the team. Nobody thought this was a happy place that we were in, but we didn't know how to change it. And all we could do was say, well, next year we'll create the release branch earlier. Give us more time, take the pressure off. And that just kept going and going and going. I'm not going to go through those, but that was a sense of the number of manual tests. So these are the things that we ran on the testing day. Um, 147 different tests, each of which probably took 5, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour to go through. 
So I've been to lots of these talks, lots of these conferences. I know in my heart of hearts that the thing that you need to do is automate the testing, automate the manual testing. And we did actually have several attempts over the years at automating the graphical user interface testing of our QT applications. And finally, in 2017, we started to make concrete progress with this. So this tool, Squish, produced by a company called FrogLogic, um, exists to allow um, driving via clicks, keystrokes, and recorded or computer-generated clicks, keystrokes, and things like that of QT applications. Um, and on our fourth attempt, we got successful maintainable tests out of it um, over a period of about 10 years. We actually had a couple of earlier attempts that got enough usable tests, but we didn't manage to run them automatically. And the big achievement over the last year is so Team City is our build system. And we managed, uh, what this is showing is the test passing on Linux 32. And we've had them running there for um, somewhere between six months and a year. And just last week, we had some um, squish experts come in and help us. Um, get feedback on the testing mechanism, strengthen it, fix a few, few problems we were having. And so this is in the progress process of us getting um, squish um, builds. So you see here, we, this, is the, this is what we have for a pipeline. We have, this is our one pipeline in our C++ builds, continuous release, and then after every commit, run the squish tests. So this is our brave new world. Um, so right. 2016 release, we, after the, the retrospective from that, we said, that was good, that was fantastic, it went really well. <laughs> Come to, oh, sod it. Come to, excuse my French. 2017 release, it's got to be good, right? It's got to be better. Um, no, it wasn't. The 2017 release was incredibly painful. Let me, I'm just going to explain, actually, for any PowerPoint users here, what I did in the last 24 hours was to do a recording of this and run through it. And having done that recording, it's remembered the timing. So if you're wondering what's going on, if you're going to do that before you practice a talk, if you know how to, that would be awesome. Thank you. So we got to the 2017 release and we really expected this would be this nice streamlined thing. We got all this automated testing and unfortunately it really wasn't like that. So this represents now, we've added 2017, still 12 months per release, and yet huge pain, huge, huge pain. I'll spare you a lot of the gory detail of the pain, but I just want to describe one aspect of it, the second thing, the showstopper, Mac, bug. See, see how this feels. Um, so we know that our release cycle coincides with Apple's new operating system version re release cycle. Whenever we released, we'd have to deal with our software getting broken by Mac changes. That's fine, that's, that's normal. This year, though, during our release cycle, we started getting reports from users that our previous year's software, so we knew it wasn't something we'd, we'd broken in the last year, if they double-clicked on one of our file types that we had a file association, our, the, the process started, you could see the, the bouncing sphere in the, the dock or whatever, but the window never appeared. So what do you do? The natural thing is you try again, you double click a second time. From that point on, your Mac, you could not kill either of those processes, even from the first point, you couldn't kill the process. You couldn't shut your machine down, you couldn't reboot. Our users, the only way they could reboot their machines at that point was to pull the power on them. And if it was a laptop, that probably meant taking the battery out. I don't know. So, right. OK, and behind the scenes, it was a security, an Apple security change. Um, all of our applications were launched by launching a script, which set up the environment, told it where to find associated files, DLLs, shared libraries, that kind of thing. And then it started. And all, all of our inter-process communication and file associations all depended on those scripts. So we're getting close to a release. Our developers, Mac developer in particular, already seriously stressed by other internal, um, a small number of other internal breaking changes during the year. And now suddenly we've got an issue for external users. And by the way, we've got to completely rewrite how we launch our applications, how they find files, and we can only test that once. <laughs> so 
And I should say at this point that this is an organisation that really, really values work-life balance. And nobody ever puts pressure on people to work long hours. But if you take pride in your work and you know that this work isn't going to go away until it's done, there is a tendency for some people to stay late and keep fighting. Um, and when you're their line manager, there's a, you take on that same pain as well. So the stress was really visible. And yeah, half of our C++ developers spent four solid months on this, third of the year. And meanwhile, the other teams weren't able to plan for upcoming work. They weren't getting feedback on what they'd done. So we knew it had to change, but we didn't know how. And how is use the pain. It dawned on me at some point that we had to make this visible internally. This couldn't be an internal team thing. Uh, we'd, we'd been doing all the things that everybody told us we needed to do, automated testing and things like that. It wasn't enough. So we needed to work out how long term, how to make an improvement. This is the point where I admit that, or I describe that, the way that our planning is done is we have plans for a whole year. So our teams work in an agile way and the organisation is evolving to plan more frequently. But right now, towards the back end of each year, um, knowledgeable people get together, take input from others, plan what we're going to do for the coming year. Um, and that's fine. Um, and the budget's planned at the same time as well. And some wonderful, wonderful person put on our plan for 2018, do three interim releases. And honestly, this is how we succeeded. The statement that we had to succeed, the statement that everything else we were doing wasn't enough, Let's try something different. I don't know how it stayed on the plan. I'm really, really grateful that it did. So it enabled me to have conversations with the teams to say, you know what, now we're going to keep, keep uh, we've been saying for a long time we'll keep trunk releasable, now we're going to keep trunk releasable. Um, so 30th of November last year, that was the point that we actually got the release out. So we got the release out, the November release out in November, which was a Herculean effort. And I was immediately asked, where do we put bug fixes? Where do we, you know, where do we put new features? And in the past, it would have been a, a probably we'd carried on developing um, improvements on that branch for a while. And so I agonised and I went to chat with um, our product manager, Pete Wood, and we concluded that we were going to do it. We were going to carry on um, developing on Trunk. So, okay, so I've been coming to these slides, these, these, uh, these meetings for years. I should have been really excited at submitting that, right? I was shaking when I actually hit send on that because I knew it was such a significant thing and it felt like uh, kind of no U-turn. And I had to realise that if it was difficult for me, it was going to be difficult for other people as well. So we started an internal campaign of communication, kind of change management, but reassurance. Um, so the um, squish testing that I talked about, we demoed it to key stakeholders, trying to change the culture the, from this will never work, it will never be stable to look, it's worth investing in. Um, lots of publicity, a few minutes at an all staff meeting explaining what was going to happen, reassurance that we were going to be listening to concerns. Um, I think it's really important to understand um, the concerns whenever you're trying to drive a change. There can be really germs of important information in there. Uh, and I'd been advocating this change for so long, I had a pretty good idea of what the vast majority of the concerns were. They were really useful. An obvious one is four releases times four months doesn't fit into a year. So then you talk about risk reduction and uh, having the motivation to accelerate and automate processes that are too slow. A big thing for us is some of our, in, some of our users can only install once a year. So if you imagine this grey bar is a, a timeline representing a year, one of our users this is the point in the calendar year that their university, their company or whatever says, right, we're going to install the software. And our annual release comes on a few days or a few weeks later. What they're installing is nearly a year old. They're going to be using it for a year. By the end of it, they're using something that's nearly two years old, if it still runs on any operating system updates they've had in between. Suppose we manage four releases a year. 
and um, our user still installs. We can't change their constraints, um, but they install same point in the year. It's really visible that they're, what they're getting is something that is no more than three months old, and they've had up to nine months of improvements, features, uh, that we've had feedback from other users, and so the features have got better. And this is so counterintuitive to people, I, but it was really, really valuable to explain. So I met all the teams, um, a series of meetings in which I started by saying, our goal is to make releases boring where boring means not stressful, predictable, and so on. Lots of explaining, lots of wait, but, wait, but, wait, but slides. So of the things I knew I was going to um, get pushed back on, lots of reassurance. Explaining about feature toggles. It's OK if we've got a feature that's being developed on trunk and it's not ready. We'll just hide it from users, but internal users will be able to give you feedback. All of those things. Most of those meetings took between an hour and a half and two hours in which I talked for probably 45 minutes or an hour and then just listened and got really useful. The people who felt the most pain, and a lot of them with our previous processes, a lot were outside development teams. They were, we'll give anything a go. We've got to try and change something. That was fantastic. So at the, I think the root of what we've done all that we have done is redefined what we mean by our release period. It is no longer going to be, this is when we finish fixing bugs, finish features, document and test. It's this is when we get it out of the door and that period will keep on getting shorter. It took me years to understand that that's what we needed to do. Um, and that, drive, that changes the conversation from is it, positive, is it perfect? because it's going to have to last for a year to is it better than it was in the last release. Um, we've said to teams things like, if you don't have anyone available to test the feature that you're working on, and you might have expected it to be tested in six months' time, this is radical, but don't implement the feature. If you can implement a feature, that's great. If you can't fix bugs, if you can't do that, which is very unlikely, look out for process improvements. That doesn't mean to say that's the only time we improve process, by the way, but it's saying developers don't keep churning out stuff that we can't release. Focus on helping us keep it more releasable. So at last day of January, we created a release branch. We called it the Update 1 release. We released it last day of February. So it still took a month, which is a quarter of our four months, which doesn't sound like it's a success. But there were, um, we had more than a 90% reduction in the number of change sets on that release branch. And a lot of those changes were in the testing mechanism. So that's huge. Um, and developers have found it very motive, uh, you know, huge benefits in terms of motivation. The most critical thing I've heard said is, but there weren't many new features. So of course it was easy, right? Um, and that was kind of by design. We, we set out to, to have a smaller period um, in this, this stage. But I've heard it said that if you want to drive this sort of change, that's, we did that by chance, but you should do that deliberately because you really want to maximise the chances of success of the first time that you do something different. And it's always going to be harder the first time. So I'm really happy with that. So here we have it, 2018, three months for a release, and we absolutely will have three more releases this year. Wonderful blog post on our website, the day of launch. This is, we don't normally have technical blog posts. It's not a technical organization. So that public support was really important. And I truly think that the missing link was the belief that it would work. If we had believed it would work, that we could release more often, we could have done it earlier. But it had to be so painful that it had to force us to do what was, was really a frightening change for people. And, and then with hindsight, they kind of, what's the big deal? So it was a combination of um, years of saying, this, we can do this, followed by senior leadership saying, you've got to do this, followed by weeks internally of saying, we'll make this work. It's nothing new. Trust me, I've been to dozens of conferences and talks and books and you know all the rest of it. It will work for us. So, shoots, blossoms, excitement on the way. Um, 
I have talked about the lessons as I've gone through, so I'm going to skip past that. And I think the key message is showcase the, ben the benefits of what you do uh, and just do it, depending on the scale of the change, or just get started if just do it is too, too optimistic. Um, some links. Uh, Mary Williams' talk at Pipeline three years ago talks a lot about the technical things, changes that you need to make moving away from monolith. That's fantastic. Another really good um, blog post in the middle. And I'm sure everybody here knows about feature toggles. If you, in case you don't, this is a fantastic, fantastic or detailed article about them. Um, if you want to print your own 3D print, um, here's a blog post saying how you can download data from our website, download the free software, and set that up. And you just send it to a commercial printing service, service and five, 10 pounds later, depending on how big and how fancy, maybe a bit more, you get a nice. So, you know, like it, say you know someone whose life has been changed by a particular medicine, you can download the 3D structure of that medicine, give them a 3D print, something to, that kind of thing. Um, my contact details here with the slides at the end. So thank you very much indeed for your attention.